Hello adventurers and welcome back to my channel. Today we are here in Springfield, Missouri and we are about to go to the History Museum. Now this isn't just any history museum, it's a brand new one with state of the art, really cool stuff inside. And I am so excited because this is located right on Route 66. Okay guys, so we are masked up and ready to go. It's $16 admission for an adult and we have a total number of galleries that we're gonna go through today of six permanent galleries and one temporary rotating exhibit. So we have a lot of stuff to do today and we're gonna start off with uh, this. Can, can you see this guys? This is a train inside the building. I can only imagine what we're going to encounter if this is literally the first thing in the door. But we'll get to that in a minute. First, we're gonna start off with the Native American Gallery. And here we can see the legacy of the Native Americans in this particular area. Look at this, guys. These appear to be some bear tracks. And normally I don't walk toward the tracks, but today we might have to make an exception to find out what exactly the bears are leading us to. Are those bunny tracks? I think they are, guys. Now, keeping on the subject of tracks, along this entire area right here, you can find a variety of different kinds of tracks that you might find out in nature and it shows you what the front and hind feet would have looked like, as well as what the critter would have looked like as well. And that is so fun, super relatable for the kiddos, but also helpful for somebody who likes the outdoors. Now along these sections right here, we find out about the different tribes that actually called Missouri home. And there's some artifacts from each one of them, as well as their stories and territory maps. So as we go along, for example, this is the Kickapoo. The Kickapoo here, it shows where the first people to live in the Great Lakes region of present day Michigan and Ohio. But then as you continue to go through this, it talks about how they pushed into Missouri and what the map here might have looked like for Here's Springfield right here. And then this is Green County as a whole. And you can see where the villages and the mounds would have been. And then this is one of the Kickapoo girls wearing the trade silver beads. There's also a medicine pouch. Now, of course, at the time of the Native Americans were predominantly in this area, trade was a really big deal. So that's why we find these things that might have been trade items in these cases. They would have been used in exchange for something else that the natives could have provided. And that ranges. When you read through history, it could have meant that they would exchange in order to have services provided by the Indians, such as guide services. They could have traded for food or pelts, different kind of items like that. So there's a variety of different things that these trade items could have been significantly linked to and uh, seeing some of them is kind of neat. This is actually a treaty that was signed in St. Louis County, Missouri in 1932 and it is an example of the endless relocation history of the Kickapoos during this time period. So as we know through history the Indians were moved time and time again off of their own lands and it was through things like this that they lost the legal authority to have right to their own spaces. Now, after they were pushed from space to space, they eventually settled in places like New Mexico and Oklahoma, Texas, those kind of places. And you can still to this day find ancestors of the Kickapoo tribe there. Now, this is about the Delaware and the Lenape. Now, if I say any of these things incorrectly, I am sorry. I really am trying, guys. This is the forced migration. Again, this is what would happen. So these tribes originally came from this area right here. And the more that they were pushed, the more that they had to go Western and eventually ended up in tribal areas right here 
in Oklahoma. It's pretty sad because the Indian Removal Act is what changed the way that the Native Americans were able to be an active participant in not only their lands that they had had previous, but even today. So coming in here and seeing all of the different tribes and how that they were impacted through Missouri directly is just really sad, guys. It's super, super sad. But we definitely want to celebrate the rich history of the Native Americans. And with displays like this, we're able to learn more about them. And I think that that's wonderful. This is a Delaware bandolier bag. And this was the print that was inspired by the ever-changing landscapes of the movement. Right here you see that in 1866, a group of 12 Delaware negotiated a treaty with Washington, D.C. that they relocated their people from Kansas into Oklahoma as a part of the Indian Territory. And many of these particular agreements that were reached in order to relocate involved what would now be considered absolutely nothing. Um, about $4,000 was exchanged in order for the Delaware to move in the early 1800s and abandon their land completely in Indiana to move to Missouri. $4,000. Now at the time, that was a lot. However, in modern day, we know now that sometimes you can't put a price on freedom. This is an Osage finger woven sash and also a cradle board. And this is what that might have looked like in use right there. These are some of the Osage men in full dress. Notice that they have something very specific on their head. And this is what that would have looked like right here. Now the Trail of Tears, as we know, was one of the worst times in American history for a large culture of people and it ran straight through the Springfield area. In fact, there's a little map over here that I want to show you guys to show you kind of the path that the Native Americans would have had to have taken. Okay, here we are at the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which is in Tennessee. And each one of these lines out here represents a portion of the Trail of Tears. It wasn't one set route, like many think. There were actually several different routes to get over various points of the terrain. And you'll notice that Springfield is right here. That was a part of the Northern route. And the route actually ran straight through Springfield over to Wilson's Creek, through Pea Ridge, and then down to Fayetteville before it crossed over into this section of Oklahoma. Now throughout the museum we'll find lots of different things that we can interact with and this is one of them. We can actually press here to listen to five different audio passages in regards to this map and the Trail of Tears itself. Just up from the Native American Gallery we have several historic photos from around the Springfield area and these are just really neat. These are buildings that over time have told many stories and now they're here to share those stories in the museum. But now guys, it is time for us to move up to the third floor. Why the third floor? Because this is the trains, trolleys, and transportation section of the museum. And here we are in for a treat. That locomotive that we saw downstairs is on this level. One group at a time, let's board the Frisco train. Super cool guys, do you see this? We're literally going down the track right now. You can see the, the ground is passing us. This is really, really neat. And we can uh, do this. Oh, look at those poles. Look at this. We are now flying, flying down the track. And then we have an interactive game here. So let's find out if we can make it from Springfield to St. Louis. So let's pick a 1930s train since we're on a train. 
and here we go. So we're gonna move up and down to avoid the obstacles, but we have to pick up our passengers. Okay, we gotta pick up the passengers. We're doing good so far. We pick up so many passengers. Oh no! Here we go, yes! Oh, there's a cow, let's not hit it. No! Oh no! Uh oh. Okay, I'm not saying that we couldn't do it. I'm saying that I need to not be looking at you guys while I'm trying to do it. So, uh, we did make it, but we had a lot of oopsies along the way. Okay guys, so we came out of there and that was a fabulous experience. And then we come out here and I see some goats. Yeah, it's a little goat. Like right here, it says here that reflected in the water of the Phelps Grove Lake Park, there was a herd of goats. That's kind of fun. It's part of the zoo that was constructed in the early 1920s. This is a reflection of a postcard that used to be popular and it shows the fast night pool and that was a place that people would come to cool off during their summer days. Time to touch to begin. Okay, here we go. Um, there's a couple different things that we can watch. The city park or the rails. So I think we're gonna do the park since we just got off of the train. 100 years ago, the city was a growing community with a population of over 40,000. It had many things to be proud of. Very neat how these are put together. Pretty interesting video. If you will sit down and actually watch these, they are fascinating. And that one talked about how the Park Service has evolved over time and now has so many locations here in the Springfield area for you to get outside and stretch your legs, see some cool stuff, and enjoy outdoor sports. So that was really, really neat. But we're not finished. This floor has a lot of other things that are just waiting to be discovered like this trolley car. See guys, it, it's a big one. Yeah, we can't really miss that one. Okay guys, when we come inside the trolley, it looks as though we have a little remote control and three screens in front of us that are showing us some really neat videos. Okay, so we touch the button to begin, it looks like, and it's gonna stop at different time frames and tell us a story. So here we go, touching the red button. Oh wow. Okay, so now we're going to follow the directions which are up here and it says to push the start button again. So here we go. And then we need to use this joystick to get off the ride when we get to the time frame. Let's go to the 1800s. Okay, so forward. And that means we push start to go again. So let's go to, let's see, that is 1819. Let's go a little bit further. Okay, 1858. Okay, we're in 1858 right now, guys. In the mid 1800s, there was no official way to get mail across the country. John Butterfield contracted with the US government to create an overland mail route from St. Louis to California. John Wilkinson, a 10-year-old Greenwood student, sneaked out of his house, got on his bicycle, and pedaled to the Shrine Mosque. He found the dressing room of that night's performer, Elvis Presley. So this is super cool. There are over a hundred different things that you can see if you just sit and stop and go through the different points and i love that and finding things that are relevant even in today versus just the ones that are from the 1800s is kind of neat also because depending on what part of history you're looking into the time machine can show you everything. Okay guys, we have another set of stairs to go up and as you'll notice, as we go around the different locations, there's these amazing photos and postcards and things that are all relevant to the past of Springfield. And I think that that's just amazing because a lot of times whenever you come into a museum, you have just a blank wall, like, like this tiny little blank wall right here, but it's everywhere. And here you're just enveloped by the room and the history. And so it's so cool. As we move into this section, we have some really cool settlers information. And 
along this wall over here, we're going to have a timeline to go down in just a moment. But first, we're about to go to General Smith's Tavern. I rode into Springfield on a red sorrow horse. I was 28 years old. And now at the end of 50 years, I got out of the man. Now, I'm not sure who did all of these, but all of the amazing attention to detail on all of the videos when it comes to the graphic work and the actual construction of the videos is, I would compare it to the Smithsonian, guys. It is so, so good. Now, this right here would have been used to melt lead over a fire, and then they could have created bullets or balls from that that would have gone into their guns which are above these are some of the items that you would have seen a pastor on the pioneer carrying with them and this would include saddlebags and hymnals travel bibles a fleam and then also a wool blanket, just in case. Now alongside each one of the displays, of course, it does go into a little bit more information about why those items would have been helpful and also who might have donated those items to the museum here. I think that's the thing about coming to museums like this. They have so many cool things and I want to show all of them to you. But if I did, the video would be hours long guys okay along this wall we have a timeline and you'll notice that springfield was originally founded in 1829 and then it talks a little bit about the springfield founders right here in this bio and it's pretty interesting to see the story itself but even more so to follow down the timeline of those who settled here in 1830 and 1837 now keep in mind, when these people settled here, there was nothing. So they had to do everything for themselves. And if you think of Springfield in modern days versus the conditions that they found it in, it is mind-blowing how much came from so little. These are some of the tools which might have helped them to initially build this new community. And these tools are pretty primitive, guys pretty primitive in addition on the back of each one of these displays we find different people that might have been relevant to these areas and each one of them have some really cool stories for example martin hubble here was involved in a variety of community activities he also served in many occupations throughout the years and was one of the founding members of the Springfield Masonic Temple. This man right here, Joseph Roundtree, was actually the first teacher in the Springfield area. So all of the education that we have today in Springfield started out with this one guy. And now you might know Springfield for the numerous hospitals and doctors that they have, but at one point in time, this guy right here shouldered all the responsibility. This was James Slavins. He operated his business of being a preacher and a physician off of a horseback. And now we move into the Civil War. Now just outside of Springfield, Missouri is Wilson's Creek Battlefield. And that was the first official battle in the state of Missouri that had to do with the Civil War. After that battle, about three years took place where there was conflict after conflict after conflict here in the state. But how did Springfield play into all of that? This is actually the ordinance abolishing slavery in Missouri. And it shows here that they were declared free people. And then as you can see, it's a little tattered and torn. But if you look really closely at all of this super, super scripty font, you have a whole bunch of different names on here. And these were all of the names that had signed this particular document. Now that document was signed on January 11th, 1865. They abolished slavery here in Missouri. But that wasn't until after a lot of bad stuff happened. Like here, the Battle of Wilson's Creek that we were just talking about. Here we have the actual Battle of Springfield. 
But the Battle of Springfield was not the only Battle of Springfield. There was more than one. It was actually a second Battle of Springfield on January 8th, 1863. Now what this museum does is allow us to see just how the war impacted this area directly. Before everything was thriving, booming, moving along, growing, expanding, new businesses, war halted everything. This is what a pharmacy kit might have looked like when on the battlefield as well as some of the other tools that would have been necessary for taking care of the injured or wounded. Now something kind of interesting also about Missouri is despite the fact that they were made a state who believed in slavery, most of them didn't actually believe in slavery. And they tried to abstain completely from being a part of any conflict in the war. Along this wall we find several of the stories of those who were a part of the time and you'll notice here there are men there are women there are black there are white there are confederate and there are union like mary phelps she actually was a springfield citizen who was an advocate for women's rights she was a union supporter and during the battle of wilson's creek she brought supplies to the battlefield and helped care for the wounded she later was recognized by Congress for her service. And this, this is Rhoda Ray. She actually was a slave that lived on the Ray farm. And I've done a video about Wilson's Creek Battlefield and she was mentioned in it. But she actually became a nurse to all and took care of everyone, even those who opposed her simply for being herself. Moving out of the Civil War and into the wild, wild west, Missouri has its fair share of wild, wild western stories to tell also, including one, Wild Bill Haycock. Here we go, there is Wild Bill right there. Okay guys, so during the wild, wild west, pistols and guns became the thing and they became advertised and marketed and this is actually a firearms brochure that you could find in about 1860. this is a classic hickok look right here as you can see he has the double rifles the belt the sash and there you can see him in similar regalia now this right here is why wild bill is in the museum this was considered to be the first shootout in the old west and right outside of this square, this is where it all happened. Okay, so there's the square outside, as you can see. And Hickok actually stood where that fountain out there is right now. And then Tut, who was his opposition, was somewhere over here in this grassy area. And that happened in July 21st of 1865 guys the square looked very different then of course but that's where it happened and then while we're here we can recreate that moment in this little shooting gallery so around the corner we go but before we do let's find out who Wild Bill was. Here we go. Before he was Wild Bill, he was James Butler Hickok, born and raised on a farm in Illinois. He moved to Kansas when he was 18. Okay guys, let me give you the backstory on the shootout that happened, okay? So initially they met, they were friends, it was all good. And then they started getting into these little disputes. They would play poker together and it only added tension, but finally they decided to fight over a woman. And that woman made them on edge so much that whenever some things that normally would slip under the rug started to happen, it was just a tipping point. Tut actually started trying to help the opponents that Hickok was playing in poker and Hickok went nuts. It was over. They couldn't do this anymore. So the shootout began. Okay guys, we're gonna move inside now to the shootout. We used a little bit of hand sanitizer and now what we're gonna do is we're going to try to shoot like Wild Bill.
Not too bad if I do say so myself. Okay, right here we have a timeline that actually takes us through the life of Wild Bill Hickok. And of course it ends right here on 1891 and this is the final stone monument to James Butler, Wild Bill Hickok. It was dedicated to him at Mount Moriah Cemetery in Deadwood, South Dakota and his body was laid to rest there. However, in 2002, a bronze replica replaced the original tombstone. But hey guys, let's bring it to a little bit more of a modern age. We're going to leave the West in the West and we're going to go on a cruise down Route 66. Did you know that Springfield, Missouri is the home of Route 66? Well, today we're gonna to find out a little bit more about that and some other facts about Route 66 here in Springfield. We're gonna start off with Mr. John T. Woodruff. John T. Woodruff believed that good roads could lead to happiness within a community and economic growth. And they were a reflection of a vibe, a mood, and so much more than just a road. And he kind of had this idea that America needed a mother road. It needed something that could bring it together, that could define the entirety of the United States. And he pursued this dream by creating the idea behind Route 66. So we're gonna sit down in this car right here and check out a little bit more about what gave him this vision and what came of the mother road. Now, interesting why it became 66 after watching this. So the roads running from east to west were all evens. The roads running from north to south were all odds. At some point, there was a highway that connected Chicago all the way to Los Angeles, and they named it Route 60. Kentucky protested. They didn't like it. And as a result, 60 was changed to 62. But then counter protest happened from Missouri and Oklahoma, and they discovered that 66 was not taken. They thought it was catchy and thought it was an appropriate thing to change the road to because it was in fact an even, and they liked the tune that it sounded like when it came out of your ear. So 66 was actually founded here in Springfield as a result, and then it became highly promoted in partially an effort to outdo Kentucky. Now the reason that the highway system was such a big deal is because way back in the early 1900s, a focus of safety and travel began. Now I can respect this because I, as a traveler, really, really have been impacted. Along the way, somewhere, roads became more than just roads. They became a rite of passage. They became featured in books, movies, songs. They were much more than just a way for you to get from point A to point B. They were a thing all their own. And that was the case definitely with Route 66. This right here is the telegraph that changed everything. As the road started to take on life of its own, things popped up along the way. Attractions to want people to stop there and check things out. Anything to bring tourism and business along the way. And because of this, we have some of the most iconic stops of all times still dotting this road that I've traveled most of. It has its own song. There you go. I bet you've heard it. Get your kicks on Route 66. A single city's legacy has been able to grow and expand as a result of a single road. You can find St. Louis Cardinals fans for miles and miles and miles as a result of the easier commute and also the intensified radio programming. 
This right here is an arch that still to this day can be found along 66. It was built in 1923 and it actually linked two towns, Baxter Springs and Galena in Kansas. This is actually known to be the last remaining concrete bridge of this type and they call it the Rainbow Bridge. Now if you were located on 66, you had no worries. You could shoot for the stars, have bigger neon, larger than life attractions. If you could dream it, you could do it and people would stop to see it. It was the ultimate way for you to draw in your crowds. So you'd see signs like this one, which is actually from a location right up the road and you could see it in the dark driving down those single lanes of the highway or you could see <laughs> something like this guy which we're about to look at this is the gigantic oil man that's located in tulsa and he stands so tall guys i've seen this it's massive and you could see him for pretty much miles because at the time tulsa wasn't very developed up these might look familiar this is actually Route 66 going through Amarillo. This is the Cadillac Ranch. Now this wasn't created until later. It was created in the 1970s. And they buried 10 cars, tail fins up. And it's pretty neat because now you can go there and spray paint. Another later development, this is the Catoosa Blue Whale. And this is right outside of Tulsa also. It is super cool. So basically the story behind this is a guy wanted to do something cool for his family so they could have a neat swimming hole. And it became so popular that even to this day people visit it. Not to swim, but to just get a glimpse. right here is one that we saw in the actual time machine and this is the story of the boy who told Elvis that he was a horrible guitar player now later on in life that boy went on to be a member of the taking care of business band and it is rumored that the character in Forrest Gump who teaches Elvis how to move is actually modeled after his story now you know that they take little pieces of factual history in Forrest Gump and they modify them to the storyline so uh, it's a possibility pull up get some fried pies for only 25 cents a Papa Burger for 75 cents. Ooh, A&W. Now on each one of these neons, you will find a photo of this particular neon when it was alive and thriving. And right here we have the sign for the drive-in that is right here. This is the Sunset Drive-In Theater. Been here, that was a fun stop on Route 66. Now, if you've been with the channel for a super long time, you'll remember that one. I actually got to take a picture on top of a big bunny. Like, it's a really big bunny, and you sit on top of it. And I was, at the time, wearing my big bunny head, just kind of being silly. Now, the bunny head doesn't travel with me anymore because it's just problematic for packing. But yeah, we, we've been there together, guys. Of course, guys, the Grand Canyon trip, that is what started my entire blog. I wanted to go to the Grand Canyon. I'd never been there. And after I went, I couldn't do anything else. I'm telling you, this wall is filled with so many amazing stops and amazing memories. Now, one day I hope to take you down the entire Mother Road on a series by itself. I've been to a lot of the Mother Road, but we have several stops that we still need to hit. So maybe, just maybe, that'll be on my bucket list for next year. I'm hoping. Steak and Shake got its start on Route 66. It's been going strong since 1962. 
Did I spend a little bit more time in the Route 66 section than others? Yes, absolutely. But this part speaks to me and to our travels together. These things like this right here are what make it possible for us to go on adventures. These epic places, epic places like Route 66. Now it's time to go through that last gallery which is downstairs. Guys, did you know that the person who wrote the song, yeah, that one, um, he was from right here in Springfield. So this right here shows that and has a little information about him. His name is Tom Whitlock. And this very talented man right here literally sings in my head this song. It's sung by a woman, but it was written by a man. But he embodied it perfectly so a woman could sing it. Wow! Okay guys, last but not least, we are in the Bicentennial Quilt area. This is the Missouri Bicentennial Quilt. They celebrated their 200th anniversary. And right here it shows that each block submission was accepted between October 8th, 2018 and September 2nd, 2019 and then they were all quilted together for the Missouri Star quilt. And then here's them working on that right there. Now if you look at this really carefully, it shows that every county is represented in some way, shape, or form. Now each one of these is so different and so neat. Wow. This is Missouri in a quilt right here. If you're looking at this, you're seeing a glimpse of what it is to be a part of Missouri's history. Look at this one right here. This is so much detail. Like you can even see the cast of the color in her face. The Lewis and Clark Trailhead Plaza. Look at this, this is awesome. They have a Mastodon Park in Jefferson County. The home of sliced bread. I've been there. I love that place. Look at this, guys. This is George Washington Carver. Branson is represented as is Table Rock right here in the Taney County Square. This has to be one of my favorites. This is Ripley County. This one is represented through Braille, which is so neat. The Ray County Coal Mines. So many amazing, talented people. Look at this. Okay guys, as always, as we wrap this video up, we exit through the gift shop. And here you can find books on the subject matters that you can find in the museum. So you can dive a little bit deeper into the details if you're interested. I definitely recommend you guys come in and check it out. I have had a wonderful afternoon here and I hope that you guys did too. If you did, make sure that you hit the like on this video, subscribe, check out the link in the description below for the museum itself, and I'll see you guys guys next time. Bye!